first, this is my first time to, to have a public webinar and it's really different not being able to see the faces of the people you talk to. But having said that, uh, let me uh, thank the team that has worked on these uh, on this report, so Val, Jana, Chris, and uh, Jason. Uh, from uh, Sheila's introduction, uh, the team's composed of people from uh, very diverse backgrounds, but mainly from health, uh, epidemiology, economics, South economics, public economics. So, and we also want to thank the people who has uh, looked into this uh, paper even before it was sent out uh, publicly because uh, 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 these has helped um, how helped how the discussion was shaped and and it, we were able to see, they were able to see through our blind spots so it really has enriched the the paper um, about the paper uh, just a brief overview uh, background um, we started working on this paper. Uh, when COVID-19 uh, was uh, like started here in the Philippines. Uh, nagsimula siya actually nung uh, then uh, the uh, chair, uh, Secretary Pernia asked PIDS as a board of, as a head of the board of trustee to, to look into the potential impact of uh, COVID-19 in the Philippine economy. And we started working on this uh, middle, of, uh, middle of March and we really don't know anything about COVID-19 during that time. The world is in panic, uh, it's, it's a growing pandemic. And over the next month from March 15 until the paper was released, we've actually uh, updated a number of times because of new information about the epidemiology of COVID-19 and how it has progressed in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, in the report, if you were able to read it, uh, there are a number of sections and that would be the outline of our presentation. So in the first part, we would look at, we would discuss the projection model that we used. Uh, and, and using that model, we were able to project what's the potential impact of COVID, uh, what's the potential magnitude of COVID-19 uh, in the Philippines, given different policy levers that, that at that time we were thinking that the, the government may, uh, may use. And using this projected uh, outbreak, uh, projected epidemiology in the Philippines, how would that impact the health system resource requirements to be able to, to deal with the epidemic? And then moving forward, what does that mean for the economy? And then we would close the presentation with recommendations. For the first part, we would have uh, Ms. Ui to talk about the model, and then I would go through the economy-wide impasse, and then uh, Dr. Ulep would go through the recommendations. Uh, Jana? Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So again, the first objective is really so assessing the potential to the trajectory of COVID-19 in the Philippines using a disease transmission model uh, with inputs using Philippine data and also literature. So next slide, please. Um, sorry, Nick. Yeah. Um, so before anything else, um, here is an overview of our data sources for the disease transition model. Um, the data for our model really came from Two sources. So that's first, the, the DOH Epidemiology Bureau, uh, namely the data on confirmed cases and deaths, and also duration of certain events, like for example, what is the time um, from symptom onset um, to when patients seek care, from the time they seek care, when do they get their test confirmations, from the time they get confirmed, um, how long before they recover or they die, or do they die. Um, the other part was really from literature, um, because as we know, in early disease outbreaks, um, surveillance is really difficult, um, and there was a lot of data for validation in EB. So for some parameters in our model, we really had to refer to literature, uh, more specifically um, to Chinese literature, to literature from Wuhan, because they their outbreak was almost complete, and uh, they had a better picture of um, other parameters. But, so on this side of the slide, to the right, you can uh, see really what is the system of DOH for COVID-19 surveillance. So as we know, the Philippines has a decentralized um, uh, government, uh, so that also applies to disease surveillance. So what happens is 
that in every administrative level in the government, uh, there are designated epidemiology and surveillance units. Um, and these units are in charge of, say, contact tracing, case investigation. Um, the health providers report to them whether there are suspected cases of COVID-19. And so that cascades up from cities and municipalities submitting to provinces, provinces submitting to regions, and regions and highly urbanized areas and independent component cities, those submit to DOHEB at the national level. So really, DOHEB is the final clearinghouse of all COVID data. But um, still, the collection, the validation, um, that's decentralized and the responsibility of each LGU. Okay, next slide, please. So what, what, what data did we have then? Um, so what we used was um, EB data as of April 7, because their paper was released around mid-April. At that time, there were only around 3,700 cases. And as uh, we know and as discussed uh, in public fora, um, these numbers may only represent a fraction of total active cases in the country at the time of reporting, especially in the early parts of the outbreak before they ramped up um, surveillance and uh, the health-seeking behavior of the, the population became better. Um, so with this data, um, we can see that at that time, the median case of the ages was really like old, so it was 53 years old, um, and among those who died, um, 65. So a lot of 58% uh, of the cases were males, and that's 70% uh, among the deaths. So majority of the confirmed cases uh, then were really uh, from the national capital region, whereas uh, if you look at it now, there are other hotspots like Cebu. So as of that uh, time, April 7, uh, we noted that there were around 140 um, quote-unquote important cases. These were the cases um, that had travel history prior to their symptom onset. So this is important because later you'll see that we use this information in our model uh, as a sort of like starting number of infected people. So next slide, please. Um, so here is an overview of um, quote unquote SEIR compartmental model. So before we discuss our model, I'd like to just give you a brief overview of what is this SEIR model that you keep hearing uh, everywhere. Um, so really, an SEIR model st stands for Susceptible, Exposed, Infectious or Infected, and Removed Compartmental Model. So what the goal of these kinds of models and in, in standard infectious disease modeling is really uh, to simulate how do susceptible people or healthy people get exposed to the virus or whatever infectious disease, how do they become then infected or infectious, um, and if they uh, get sick, then how do they? Uh, how long before they recover or die? Um, so how does it do this? So first, um, com what is compartments, right? So it, uh, compartment means you wanted to try to divide the population into mutually exclusive health states, quote unquote compartments. So these compartments represent distinct phases in the progression of the disease that are relevant to the spread of uh, its spread in populations. Um, so for susceptible compartment, it's, this is really those who are at risk to get the disease, so the healthy or those who are not immune. Um, so at the start of any outbreak, almost everyone is not uh, is not immune, and they are all, almost at risk. So once you're uh, so you're susceptible and healthy, but you can also get exposed to the virus. And when you're exposed, um, you don't necessarily have symptoms. Um, so there's a time period before you get symptoms, and that's called an incubation period, or a latent period is. Um, when you're exposed but not yet infectious. So here in the exposed compartment, here are the people who, may, who will develop the disease but are not yet symptomatic. Um, then next, um, you can become then infectious or infected after the latent period. Um, for example, uh, these are the people who are, who are now ill, so they're actively, uh, they can spread the disease. And the last compartment is really removed. Uh, which is you can either recover or die. And when you get to this compartment, you don't get out of it. It's like, quote-unquote, an absorbing state. So for any time in an epidemic outbreak, uh, each day, the model counts how many people are in each compartment. So that's what we are after. And that's how we can project, okay, on this day of the outbreak, how many people will be infected, removed, or exposed. So next slide, please. So in the next slide, um, for those interested in really the math, um, 
I'll, I'll try to lay it out in an easy way but you can have the intuition. Um, so in the SEIR compartment, because we're interested in how many people are there in each compartment each day. So there are allowable movements. So if you started susceptible, you can also move to become exposed, exposed to infectious, infectious to removed, right? Um, so number of people who move between compartments or across the compartments as designated by the arrows is really governed by mathematical equations. So the mathematical equations are not that um, difficult, naman. so let's give, to try to give an intuition to the audience. Um, so from susceptible to exposed, movement is really determined by the prevalence of disease. Or um, if you see the term I over N, that's just how many, what proportion of the population have a disease, right? So among those infected, they can infect susceptible people. That's the term with the S, right? And then uh, if inst infected people contact susceptible people, um, beta uh, is the, uh, the symbol that stands for what proportion now of the susceptible will get the disease. So it's really just a proportion of disease times how many susceptible times what's the probability that people will get infected. Okay, so beta is just the probability of transmission, and that's what you hear that is affected by the basic reproduction number. If you've heard the reporting of the R naught or the effective R. And um, it's also a function of how long people are infectious for. Um, say they're not isolated early, um, or say they are isolated early. So uh, that's the first part. The second part is if you're exposed and you have the disease, what determines whether you um, now move to becoming infected or symptomatic? So that is determined by, uh, from literature, the latent period of the disease. So that means, um, if, for example, the latent period is around three to five days, um, so the probability of you moving from exposed to infectious is just one over that duration. It's the same as saying if, um, for example, if people exposed to COVID take three to five days to show symptoms, every day then around 20% of the people will move from exposed to infectious. So that's uh, the Same thing when infectious are recovered, um, based on UHEV data, we have an estimate that uh, it's around 10 to 12 days before they move from infected to removed. So, good um, enough. Next slide, please. So, next slide, um, these are uh, also an important underlying assumption with these kinds of models that uh, we have to convey. So, it assumes that actually, you know, everyone in the population, they will contact each other with the same frequency, intensity, and duration. But realistically speaking, we know that's not the case, but it's an inherent limitation in the model, in the way of this modeling. And then for the other one is, I mentioned that there are durations that we assume before people move from compartment to compartment. Um, throughout the model, we assume that duration does not change. So that means that it, it's applied whether you're young or old um, and whether whatever day it is in the outbreak. So that's the caveats of the model. And that's standard across all SEIR models. So next slide, please. So for the next slide, here is actually the model we used, um, our SEIR compartmental model. And really, it's just an expansion of what you saw a while ago, of the simplification. So how did we expand it? We expanded it in um, two ways. First is, for the infected compartment, the compartments in the middle, you have like three columns, uh, we are able to stratify the, this, the people who have symptoms by severity. So that's symptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, and critical. And also because you have data on how they, um, on time to event, like for example, um, as I mentioned, this is incubation, um, whether they have onset and whether they contact health system, we're able to say, okay, which part part of the health system they are currently in, or at least the, the model is able to simulate that. Um, so the whole model for this is also stratified by province. That is, all calculations are done at the provincial level, and then we aggregate upwards uh, to help sort of relax that assumption a while ago that everyone can meet each other with the same intensity and frequency. Okay, so next slide, please. The so next slide is I just overlaid here um, the essential parameters we have in our model. Uh, so how did we sort of, what, what were the numbers that went into the calculations? Um, so let's start with the susceptible compartment on the far left. So at time zero, at day zero of the outbreak, which is January 15, 2020, 
uh, we assumed that everyone in the pop in the province was susceptible, so no one had the disease yet. Um, and then um, next, in uh, every day, then we assume that susceptible individuals in a province can meet infected people, uh, and this is this will come from the imported cases that we saw a while ago because the epidemic had to start somewhere, right? And it was not organic to the Philippines then, right? So in every day of the model, infected people can meet susceptible people and they can infect susceptible people uh, with, the, with the probability determined by the equation a while ago, like the betas and the effective reproduction number. Okay, so hunting for these imported cases and the parameters from literature. So uh, we, as we, we, we calculated and calibrated the model such as we found that in the NCR, actually, if a, if an infected person would meet a susceptible person, uh, the probability that that healthy person would get infected is around 40%. And this kind of translates to um, if an infected person, uh, one infected person can infect around three to four other people on average without intervention. So that's what the uh, numbers between susceptible and exposed just means, okay? So when you're exposed um, and you don't have yet symptoms, it takes around five to six days before you show symptoms. Um, and once they show symptoms, the distribution uh, of severity is 25% of them will be asymptomatic for the whole period uh, based on literature. 55% will be mild or moderate, and 15% will be severe, while only 5% will be critical. Um, and then once that they get their symptoms, uh, it takes around then the data from April 7. It took around six days before people could uh, go to the health system for consult or testing. Then around uh, after consult or testing, it would take around five days to get confirmation of uh, whether they had COVID or not. And among the, this, the uh, people in who got their lab confirmation, they can be at home quarantine or they can be hospitalized. Um, among the severe and critical um, case fatality was around 15% for severe and for the critical 55%. And then for, for these people, um, if you were mild and moderate, it took around 10 days for you to recover. So we don't assume that um, people who are symptomatic or mild, moderate, die only a severe and critical. And then unfortunately, if you, the data that then showed that if you had severe and critical disease and you died, it took it, it, it was very fast, like around five days. Um, so next slide, please. So to really inform potential interventions then um, early in the outbreak, we thought of these uh, sets of scenarios, uh, a total of 14 scenarios broken down into five sets. Um, so the letter suffixes indicate the length of ECQ. Um, and so A would be, um, the, stat, the status quo then, which was um, a month of ECQ, and then uh, additional um, additional two or four weeks of ECQ. And then the scenario numbers represent really what sort of interventions we were looking at. Higher number scenarios uh, were numbered that way because they represented additional interventions. So, for example, scenario zero S zero is what if we didn't do anything, no intervention, just like as a base uh, for comparison for everything that we will be intervening on. So for scenario set one, which was ECQ, um, then it approximated the current conditions. Um, so turning on ECQ means restricting interprovincial travel, closing contact points such as schools, work, and households. Um, and then that symptomatic cases are isolated when they contact the health system, um, such as going to the emergency room. And also there is an assumption that majority of the people, 95% of them would comply to the ECQ requirements that only one person in a household could go out. Okay, um, so post ECQ for S1, we assumed um, that everyone is back now free to move back, um, back to status quo. Um, so that's scenario one. Scenario two is what if you add now better testing? So what does better testing mean? Better testing meant then that in any extension of the ECQs or post-ECQs, um, our turnaround time for laboratory, laboratory con confirmation would just be four days or two days. And that we would have 
a strong isolation protocols for those who are tested. Okay, so the S3 scenario, um, just add, so what if now we don't uh, just isolate at testing or like confirmation for the test, but earlier uh, at symptom onset, okay? So what if we were able to do that around 50% for all targeted um, COVID patients or people who were exposed? So S4 and SS5 was something that um, the sub-TWG of the IATF uh, requested of us, it was, so what if we extend the ECQ, but we lifted that part of the population could go out like around 50%, but we kept up um, better testing and isolation at symptom onset. Um, and actually, what if we improve that 70% of everyone who were exposed, we could isolate at um, symptom onset. So these are the scenarios really um, uh, yeah, so next slide, please. So next slide is a summary of uh, the projections of the what we call the epidemic curve uh, for the different scenarios. So let's start with S0. So S0 is the gray curve. Um, oh, in the X, uh, sorry, in the X axis, that's just time, right? So time throughout the epidemic projected from January 15, 2020 to January 15, 2022. Um, and then on the y-axis is just uh, how many active cases are there in that day, right? So from for the uh, gray curve, the no intervention, uh, what would have happened was, uh, at least projected, that in August 2020, we would have the peak number of cases, the most number of cases in the whole epidemic. And that would be around 20% of the whole population of the Philippines. However, uh, so with the scenario one, we have uh, the blue curves, so what if we had the ECQ, right, which we did implement? So we see that the height of the curves, the curve really uh, was lower compared to uh, the gray curve, right? So then um, if we had done ECQ as we did, the peak would have been, would be in October, and we would only have a peak of around 8.5 million cases. So that's like less than half of the no intervention scenario. Um, and then if you see that there, there are different shades to the curves, uh, that is what if you extended ECQ. So the curve height would remain the same, but the curve would just be delayed. So it's as if we, we are buying time with the ECQ, right? So um, in the green curves, that represents, oh, sorry, in the purple curves, that represents scenario two. So what if we coupled ECQ with better testing and term? turnaround times. So similarly, we would have a peak in October, uh, but even less case, around 6.6 .6 million symptomatic cases. So for scenario three, um, what if we have rapid isolation of cases? So that uh, pushes down the peak even further to only 5.2 million cases, and the peak is later in November, right? Scenario four, um, there is sort of an overlap with scenario three. Um, meaning that even if we partial lift, as long as we can keep up with the isolation um, and the testing, actually uh, the, peak, the peak date and the peak number of cases is not that different. And scenario five, the red curves, is the ideal. So if, uh, if we partial lift and um, if, if we had better testing and isolation of around 70% of the cases, uh, the peak would be less than 1 million cases, and that would be around June next year. So that's a summary of the results we have. So next slide. So how, how did our model do? So the projections were, were made around mid-April, uh, right? But it's now May. Um, so just to remember, uh, to remind a reminder that our model is calibrated based on the number of deaths. Um, so that means that um, we run the model, and then at that time, we try to check, does the model agree that today these are the numbers number of deaths as reported by DOH? So now that we are out of the parang, period where we were matching uh, our projected deaths with DOH data, how did it fare? So it looks like um, for our models, we have sort of an overestimation of the current active number of infections. So for our scenarios, 1C and 3C, um, we predict that there are around 12,000 cases, um, supposedly for last Monday, 
And but the report of the OH is there are around 8,400 cases. Um, but we also have to remember that uh, not all cases are captured by the system because of testing, although that has improved greatly. And in terms of deaths, um, it seems that we have overestimated a bit, um, but not by much because um, our projections for last Monday was 850 around that, but reported by the OH is around 730. So in a sense, uh, the judgment is our model is doing okay. Maybe. Yeah. So next slide, please. So, but, but really, uh, the key message is um, in terms of trends, even if the, date, the model of the data is old, um, um, aggressive efforts in the post-ECQ period to isolate at least 70% of infectious cases through what we have actually been doing, the DOH, DOH has been doing, better contact tracing, social distancing, isolation, um, reducing the time to seek care um, and to isolation uh, is really necessary to suppress the outbreak. Like extending the ECQ without mitigation measures just delays the progression of the outbreak, and we will still get a large number of cases. So the key would be vigilance in um, mitigation efforts, really. Okay, next slide, please. So now we go to so if we have these projections of the number of cases, what resources does the health system need to address um, COVID-19 cases? Next slide, please. Using the projected number of cases from our model, uh, we try to estimate um, at least for the cases that require medical intervention at healthcare facilities. Um, to, do, to do this, we assume the following. So we assume that you know, all symptomatic cases, they will present on an outpatient basis at emergency rooms or facilities to be triaged, um, and they will be triaged for severity. And only those that are severe or critical will be hospitalized. Mild and moderate cases, as was practiced then, uh, were discharged for home isolation. Um, then severe cases who present with severe pneumonia will um, may actually need critical care, such as ICU. And then part of those who will need an ICU will also need a ventilator for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay. Next slide, please. So these are just our assumptions. We want to be transparent about the ratios we used. Um, so for at the outpatient triage, um, these are the number of staff we need for physicians, nurses, auxiliary staff, and such for a number of patients. Um, and this is also the number of PPE sets you would need. So for inpatient um, wards, there's also a ratio for the doctors and nurses. That's one to six. Um, one doctor for six patients, one nurse for three patients. Um, intensive care unit the same. Now you need a lot of like um, uh, medical specialists for this especially. So these are just the base numbers and you can review the assumptions in our paper. Uh, we hope that's transparent for you. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide is just a summary for each scenario. At the peak day, how many hospital beds, ICU beds, ventilators, PPE sets, and uh, human resources do we need? Um, so the numbers are quite large. So um, just looking at the best case scenario of scenario 5B or 5C, um, we, the country would already require something like 182,000 hospital beds, 55,000 ICU beds, 30,000 ventilators, 88,000 doctors, and so on. Um, but if you look at um, studies that have checked, so what are the current resources in the country? There are only 61,000 um, level two and level three beds. Um, and uh, the number of ventilators is around 1,800. But I think that's still an undercount given the lack of reporting of hospitals. So, so these are really big numbers. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what it's just trying to say is um, the health system at its current capacity um, cannot meet the demands of the COVID outbreak if it um, if these projections did come true. So the caveat is really these simulations, they're all modeled scenarios um, with aggressive efforts in the post-ECQ period, you know, better social distancing, enforced isolation, reduced delays for seeking care. Um, such resource costs can can surely be avoided or drastically reduced. So that's the caveat I want to say. Um, next slide, please. 
So we also tried to see uh, with the PhilHealth releasing case rates for those who are hospitalized, how much would it cost case rate, uh, PhilHealth if they reimbursed um, all COVID patients um, and, and if all COVID patients actually did claim um, their benefits, right? Um, so the PhilHealth case rate is something around 300,000 for severe cases and around 780,000 for critical cases. Um, and in all scenarios except for S5, it's really an astronomical amount. Um, and even for S5B, that's around uh, 206 billion and 268 billion. Um, for reference, in 2019, the operating corporate budget of PhilHealth was around 175 billion. Um, but I think since then, they've given a, been given a lot of new appropriations uh, and war chests uh, to subsidize COVID care in the country. So next slide. Um, to summarize, um, for all scenarios that don't successfully isolate at least 70% of infectious individuals early, uh, the demand for healthcare resources really at the peak of the outbreak will far exceed available supply in the health sector. Um, in the, only in the S5 scenarios uh, does it present a manageable timeline where we can scale up health system capacity within a year to a level that is actually reasonable in that after the outbreak, these are still usable. For example, if we address the gap in hospital beds, uh, the system would have something like a ratio of 1.7 level 2 and level 3 beds per 1,000 population compared to our current supply now of 0.6. Um, and to give context, in other countries, um, they have around two beds per 1,000 population or more. Okay, so that's um, that, the, that is the key message of health system, uh, the health system portion, um, uh, that we need to really do the mitigating measures to be able to cope and provide the demand that, uh, that will occur if we, if the outbreak proceeds at the paces we saw with our scenarios. So next slide, please. So now for the projected economy-wide impacts. Um, here is uh, Dr. Abrigo. Uh, Mike. Thank you so much, um, Jana. Um, we all know from our experience uh, in the past about two, three months that uh, this pandemic is not just an epidemic on the health, uh, health sector, but it also has important impacts on the economy. And there, from in the economy, it has other spillovers to other parts of our lives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, an easy way to visualize this potential impact of COVID-19 on the economy is looking at uh, this graph. This is from the Google uh, mobility uh, data that they've published. Uh, um, they update this regularly. So where are the Filipinos uh, at the start and during this epidemic? Uh, during the start of the epidemic, early March, you see at baseline, um, wala, wala masyadong pagbabago. But then, with the imposition of ECQ, first in Manila, and then in Luzon, then eventually, as we all know, that uh, uh, in the whole Philippines, um, much has changed in where Filipinos are going. Uh, look at uh, retail and recreation, uh, it has plummeted by 80%, uh, grocery and pharmacy, 60%. And next slide, please. Uh, workplaces, 70%. People are staying uh, inside their homes. So 40% increase. Uh, next slide. So the idea that the COVID-19 is not just uh, a health uh, sector issue, but also an economy-wide issue, uh, is shown in this graph. Uh, so we explored... What is the potential impact of having these uh, epidemic in the Philippines on employment? So what we did was we have that population level SERR model that uh, Jana discussed about. We linked that with a micro simulation um, SERR model. So from the population level, we have these individuals. Because from the population level, we, do, we don't see sino ba dito sa mga nagkakasakit ang... Um, Trabajo, sino nag-aaral, and we can see that in a micro simulation, and that, that's what we did. And from our um, simulation, we found that uh, those who are affected, um, if we count only those people who are affected by the disease, uh, ibig sabihin sila lang yung nagkasakit, uh, sila mismo yung tinamaan ng sakit, 
uh, our estimate is that about 13 percentage that, that our um, employment to population ratio uh, would go down by about 13 percentage points. So that's about uh, a quarter of our um, of our EPRs if we don't do anything uh, at the peak day. So 25 percent of our of our labor force gone. But what if we impose um, um, other mitigation measures? Because we, we know na, syempre, pag nagkasakit yung anak mo, even if you're not the one who's sick, pag nagkasakit yung anak mo, yung mga nana, yung mga tatay, hindi sila makakapasok kasi they have to take care of the children. Or uh, what if we impose yung stricter na, since pero may sakit sa bahay nyo, lahat kayo hindi pa din lumabas. So, lahat kayo isolated. So, that would ground the whole uh, labor force for that household. And if we have that, uh, our estimate is that at the peak of the epidemic, if we don't do anything, uh, the employment to population ratio would go down by as much as 30 percentage points. So 30 percentage points, if we compare that with our actual EPR of about, uh, about 60, that's half of our labor force gone because of the epidemic. And that's just because that's just the immediate effect of the epidemic. Uh, we all know that there are other mitigations that we have done, like ECQ. Uh, that also affects the makabuhayan, the labor supply of our mga kababayan. And these are important spillovers to other parts of our lives. So, kung walang trabaho, walang kita. So, kung walang kita, uh, that would affect yung, yung kakayanan ng mga household to buy goods and services in the market and therefore their welfare. Um, that would also affect yung production of goods in the market. So, kung walang workers, sino ang gagawa ng mga, mga manufacturing? Sino ang tatanin ng mga uh, agricultural products? And then, ultimately, this would affect government revenues kasi walang Walang maitak sa production, walang maitak sa household income, and that, down the line that affects uh, the ability of government to provide services that it usually provides. Uh, next slide, please. So having that in mind, uh, there are many levers that can be done by government. And well, one of that, of course, is ECQ. But I, I, when we were doing this, we were trying to think of what could be uh, the limitations of the potential interventions, potential levers that the government may do. Uh, as we know from the literature, uh, during the uh, no, uh, recent Ebola epidemic in, in Africa, uh, maraming namatay because of the, of the epidemic uh, Ebola. But then there are also uh, spillovers uh, into other sections of society. Marami ring namatay na hindi directly because of Ebola, but related to Ebola. Uh, namatay sila kasi yung resources that should have been done for other services, for other non-Ebola services, uh, hindi na naibigay kasi yung focus ng gobyerno, ng, ng community, is more on Ebola. So nakalimutan, uh, nakalimutan yung mga ibang parte na importante din kasi we should remember that COVID is not just a disease in the Philippines. It is one, but it's important, but it is not the only one. Okay, so here's just a, a rundown of the, the potential limits that we have thought about. One is that um, in the ECQ, uh, we should remember that three in every five Filipinos have limited capacity to subsist without additional support. So uh, we were using Dr. Albert's um, middle class typology and, and based on his typology, we found out that um, about three in every five Filipinos uh, yung nilang kita, kaya lang, yung isang buwan nilang kita, uh, kaya lang mag-subsist for one month or less. And that's an important issue and the government has tried to uh, try to address that uh, with the uh, SAP and the other uh, other goods that it is providing. Uh, another limitation is that uh, alternative sources of income are not equally available among different households. Uh, we are saying this because... Um, for example, um, SSS and GSIS, we know that only two in every five households have at least one family who's a member of either SSS or GSIS. And uh, with SSS and GSIS, of course, you can, you, you can, uh, pwede kang umutang, uh, pwede kang mag-calamity loan, but then it's not available to everyone. And you would expect that 
uh, the poor households would have less access to this because they are less likely to be in the formal sector. Uh, another important issue is that uh, remittances um, may not be the same, may not be at the same level as we've thought it would be. Uh, I'm saying this from the point of view that um, if you remember the 2009 global financial crisis, uh, it was we were hit hard in the export side, even in the consumption side. But what has tried us over during that time is that we have a lot of international migrant workers. And if you, uh, I have not shown the graph here, but in 2000 to 2009, 2010, like spike your adding remittances. And I don't think that we can expect that during this time, because during this time, even their, uh, even their livelihood um, are at risk. We've seen news reports na yung mga seafarers natin are going back to the Philippines. Um, one, uh, yung mga nasa coastlines, they're going back kasi yung mga coastlines are grounded and no one is going to uh, ano ba, uh, cruise. And another because is because of um, dampening of global demand. So yung mga nandun naman sa mga um, ang tawag dito, yung mga mga ships na nagde-deliver ng goods um, across the oceans. Uh, because of uh, slowing demand, grounded din yung mga uh, ships na yun. Uh, next slide, please. Um, during the start of this uh, epidemic, before time ng ECQ, uh, we were actually very hopeful about uh, telecommuting arrangements because we thought that this is, um, this, um, epidemic has forced us into this experiment that we could tinker with telecommuting arrangements uh, in work and in school. But uh, when we're looking at the data, we've realized that it may not be possible for everyone. First, uh, there are just jobs that you, you cannot do remotely, like manufacturing. You need to be there in the plant to, to do everything. If you are studying, uh, if you have a lab uh, lab work, then you cannot do it at home because wala kang mga gamit. But even the usual stuff that you can do online, uh, there could be a problem because not everyone has access to internet, not everyone has school. We actually have um, we have these statistics from the Family Income Expenditure Survey that only about 1% uh, of the poorest households have computer. So that is a, a reality that we must face even if there is this great potential from telecommuting. And finally, uh, one of the, I guess we, we were um, fearful about was the that limiting travel. While we think that this is very important in uh, limiting the spread of disease, this may have strong negative implications on the ability of consumers first to access uh, goods in, in the market. Uh, we've actually done this um, a uh, small uh, sort of survey among uh, RHUs, uh, Rangai Health Stations, and what we realized was that um, bumaba yung number of people, although this is just based on reports, that bumaba yung mga number of people, uh, pregnant women, and even those who have children, who go to the rural health units in the Rangai Health Stations for shots, for... Uh, uh, immunization, even for consultations. And, and that is a big problem. It may not be a big problem now, but it will be a big problem in the future for these children who are not able to uh, to be able to get these uh, important services. Uh, and also, this has important implications on the delivery of essential resources. So just last night, we have this report in the news. Uh, these, pe uh, these farmers from up north, uh, from Benguet or Ifugao, who cannot bring his produce, tomatoes, uh, to other markets. So, ang ginawa lang niya, tinapun lang niya. So, sayang siya sa ating lahat. It's, it's a loss of our society. Right, next slide, please. So, going now, we, to, we want to capture those uh, ideas. But, unfortunately, we cannot capture all those kasi uh, magkakaibang mga ideas yun. So, to the best... Uh, to the extent possible, we tried to, to model that using a Leontief input-output model. This is a standard model in economics. So what we do is we estimate uh, what if bumaba yung consumption 
kasi nasa loob lang ng bahay yung mga, mga, mga household, hindi sila pumupunta sa sine, hindi sila pumupunta sa park, walang bumibili ng masyado ng bubble tea. So what would that entail? What would that mean for the gross value added? Gross value added, ibig sabihin, ito yung kita ng mga tao in terms of uh, rent, in terms of compensation of employees, mga wages, even taxes for government. Uh, consumption, we look at the potential impact of loss in consumption and exports. For exports, uh, we know na walang katulad itong COVID-19 in the Philippines in the recent year. So what we thought about as, as a similar case would be the 2009 global financial crisis. And during that time, uh, our export was hit bad. And yung namang um, household demand, we link that. Uh, so we have this model, the SEIR model, and we linked it up with the micro simulation model, and we are able to, uh, to get uh, ilang tao yung mawawala ng trabaho. And from there, we try to infer uh, how much that means in terms of losses and consumption. And that goes to the model. Next slide, please. So this is the modeling strategy that we have. So uh, we started with the uh, with the epidemiology. So, ano ba yung progression ng no disease, no, no pandemic, and then we input that into the an agent based uh, micro simulation SER model so that we would know ilan ba yung mawawala ng trabaho uh, from the disease and from the uh, community interventions like ECQ, and then we have these uh, exogenous assumptions about how would exports change, how would household income change because of the employment. And then from there, we back out. Yeah, magkano yung kailangan mong bayaran na renta? Magkano kailangan na bayaran na wages sa mga, mga trabaho? Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, in our baseline models, we, ha we, have three mod we have three assumptions. So, we have the worst case, moderate, moderate case, and base case. And the moderate case and the best case are just uh, a proportion of the worst case. For the worst case, uh, pinag namin siya sa scenario S1B that uh, Jana discussed. Uh, for the rest of the world, we we assume that the pandemic will not be contained this year and, and the global economy would slow down into a recession. Uh, and based on S1B, we projected that the average annual, uh, annual average labor supply would go down by about 20%. And this translates to about 5.3% reduction in household consumption. In the export side, we assume na it will be in the 2009 GFC levels. Pwede kalaki yung mawawala sa exports natin. For the moderate case, uh, pinag namin siya sa S3B. So there's an improvement in testing and isolation. And we assume that uh, the pandemic would be contained around the world by third quarter. Uh, so consumption, uh, based on our projection, uh, so about 3.7% reduction in household uh, consumption. And for the export side, we assume the 50% of the worst case scenario. Next slide, please. And for the best case, pinag namin siya dun sa scenario S5B where you have uh, better contact tracing, uh, two days lang na isolate, uh, uh, at symptom onset, na isolate nuna yung 70% of the uh, of the cases. Uh, in the rest of the world, we assume that by second quarter, matatapos na tong pandemic. And based on that, uh, the result was that uh, there would be a 0.7% reduction in household consumption. And in the expert side, uh, we assume na 10% lang of the worst case scenario yung, mawa, yung mangyayari sa ating exports. Okay, next slide please. So these are important caveats that we should always remember, uh, that I should remember and everyone should remember uh, when interpreting the results. First is that the estimates are only indicative. Uh, it does not capture much of the, much of the potential impacts of COVID-19. So some of these impacts would be in the form, of course, on wages and income and other forms of income. But then there are other important uh, effects that could happen down the line, like because we have not, uh, we were not able to provide for the critical uh, services, goods for children. Then it would affect their uh, development, and this affect, this would affect the Philippines in the long run. So imagine hindi namin siya nakuha. 
Uh, second, we excluded yung mga expected increase in healthcare demand because of COVID-19. So we know na pag nagkasakit ka, COVID-19 is very expensive. But then, uh, sa other side naman, uh, there are reports na uh, yung mga ibang sakit na pwede namang hindi pa ma-hospital, pwede pang maghintay, hindi muna sila pupunta sa mga hospitals. And somehow, we've thought na it's difficult to to estimate that at this point, kaya hindi namin siya sinama. And finally, uh, we've intentionally uh, ano ba, biased our estimates to be conservative, to be on the low side. So parang this gives us na uh, potential range na it cannot be lower than this because we're trying to be ano ba, uh, optimistic. So this is in the lower end of the of the of the projected impacts. Next slide, please. Okay, so here uh, are the results. So based on our estimates, uh, we could lose as much as 2.5 trillion pesos. Uh, as a share of our GDP, this would be about 13%. So that's quite big. But as a worst case, it could be as small as 1.4% uh, of GDP. Uh, based on our projections, the worst hit would be uh, manufacturing, trade, and other services. But there will also be a significant impact on mining and quarrying if we would look at it uh, in a share, share by share basis. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is another projection that we did for the sub TWG on data analytics uh, for the IITF because they were asking what is the potential impact of extending the ECQ? So what if there's no extensions, uh, we stick with the original um, April, mid-April deadline? What if we extend it by two weeks and now extend it by four weeks, which is what we actually have now? And uh, based on a different scenarios about uh, what the government will do. So if there, will there be an ECQ? Will there be better testing? Will there be isolation at onset? How large is it, your compliance? And based on our estimates, what we found out is that an additional month of ECQ costs the economy about 150 billion pesos. So it actually uh, extending the ECQ buys us time. And it, it's really uh, literally buying, buying time at a you know, ticket na 150 billion pesos. So expensive and we thought that uh, this should be really worth it if it's worth 150 billion pesos. And next slide please. So the key message from this is that uh, COVID-19 does not is, is not only a health sector uh, issue but an economy-wide issue and based on our assumption based on our projections uh, we could lose about as much as 2.5 trillion in the worst case. And as I've mentioned earlier, uh, this we are trying to bias, bias this, uh, the low end. So it could be actually worse. And based on our projections, the biggest uh, losers, if I may say, would be manufacturing, wholesale needle trade, and other services. Uh, the bottom line uh, here is that, uh, from the last uh, slide before this, is that, uh, given the same set of mitig mitigation measures, um, extending the ECQ by one month, wala kang ginawang iba, extend mo lang, does not uh, change, the, change the trajectory of the, of the epidemic. It only costs us, costs us 150 billion. So if, we are, if it will be costing us 150 billion pesos, then we should be doing more than just extending. Uh, for the next... Uh, uh, set of slides, uh, Dr. Ulep would present. Thank you, Mike. Hello. So thank you, Mike. So for the recommendation, I just want to note where we just want to note that this or the recommendations were developed during the early stages of the um, of the pandemic. So I think some of these recommendations are already incorporated into the government strategy. So it might just be a reinforcement of the idea. So next slide, please. So there are basically two general recommendations. So the number one is to really maximize the implementation of ECQ. As Mike suggested, ECQ is very expensive. Although it's effective in reducing community transmission, it's very um, expensive. It has devastating impact on the economy and population health, especially mental health, et cetera. 
Um, that's why we need to optimize and maximize it by better enforcement. Um, the second is that while we are in the ECQ, um, again, this was developed, this recommendation was developed during the stages of the pandemic. Now we're graduating to, to a different kinds of, of quarantine. So we need to plan a gradual and calibrated transition from ECQ to a risk-based strategy. So when we do this, we, st we need to start planning when is the best time to transition and what is the criteria that we need to use um, in, in getting out of this phase or suppression stage. Next slide, next slide, please. So in, in during the, the, the early stages of the pandemic, we, we, we tried to list down some of the criteria in, in, in lifting the ECQ. So here are some of the um, criteria. So number one is that there is there should be a clear evidence that the transmission is controlled. Um, second is that there is a sufficient health system capacity. So I just want to re to um, to highlight here that when I say health system capacity, or when we say health system capacity, it's not only hospital capacity, but public health uh, or community health capacity. I will try to ex uh, explain that later. Third is that there is. Uh, ability of the system to protect the vulnerable population when we actually lift the ECQ, specifically health workers. Fourth is that workplaces are very prepared in an impossible um, um, resurgence of cases. Fourth is that local governments are very well prepared. And lastly is that people, people are prepared of the new normal. And I think most of these are, are you know, in fairness to the Department of Health and with the government, I think they are trying to, to, to address all of this as we lift or as we transition into a risk-based strategy. Next slide, please. So number one, so I want to I want to tease out a bit uh, those those recommendations. So number one is that there is a clear evidence that the transmission is controlled. So initially we 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 come up with or we we suggested three indicators of 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 or how do we know that the transmission is already controlled? So number one, there is a significant and consistent decline in doubling time. Second is that the significant and consistent decline in, in r naught, as what Jana was uh, uh, explaining a while ago. And there is uh, a significant decline in positive tests. So initially, during the earlier stages of the epidemic, our positive test was around 17%. Uh, 15 to 17 percent. Um, yesterday, our positive test was around like 4 percent. So what I'm trying to say here is that you're actually expanding the, the, the number of tests, but your numerator, right, is, 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 should, be, should, be, should be maintained. Um, next slide, next slide, please. Next, next slide. So next slide. So the second criteria is there should be a sufficient health system capacity. Um, when, when we say health system capacity, it's not only hospital capacity. And I think the last two months, I think we're rump rumping up a lot of our hospital capacity. We're buying, we're, 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 we're buying ventilators, we're buying isolation beds. But um, I, I think it should go, it, it, we also need to rump up our community health capacity. So, um, um, these should be this, sh this includes the capacity to to, to do testing. Uh, I, I don't want to use ma mass testing. It should be massive testing, the capacity to do massive and rational testing. Second is to capacity to trace. Third is the capacity to isolate. Fourth is the capacity to treat. And fifth is the capacity to track and monitor. Again, I want to uh, tease out a bit um, these health system capacity. Next slide, please. So number one, so there should be a sufficient health system capacity um, uh, um, to, uh, for this one is to test. Initially, during the early, earlier stages of the pandemic, so uh, um, the DOH was asking like, um, how, how many tests do we really need? Uh, during, those, during those times, the, the, the number of tests conducted by our ITM was around 500, if, I wasn't, if I'm not mistaken. 
but now it's already 8,000. But based on our calculations, we needed around like um, 10 to 15,000 to actually test those with symptoms and with those close contacts. So now we're around like 8,000 uh, tests per day. And I think the government is aiming 30,000 per day. Um, and the second strat, the, the second recommendation under this under this one is the government should have a clear strategy on how to actually democratize testing by incentivizing local governments and private sector to, in, to, to expand testing infrastructure. So looking at those possible red tapes and 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 other forms of barrier for the government, for the private sector or, or for, for local governments to actually expand their testing capacity. But what one thing we realize um, in, in, in the last in the last few weeks of this epidemic, it's not about just building lab laboratories and buying test kits. Apparently we're actually lacking of med of, of of molecular biologists, of medical technologists to do this test. And these tests are very complicated tests. So um, um, it's easy to do, it's easy to say that you need to do massive testing, but there are a lot of barriers we need to encounter, uh, that we've encountered along the way. But I think the government is, is I think, um, should be applauded for increasing the number of tests from 500 to 8,000, but that's not enough. Um, 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 uh, enough. So I think another strategy under this is to actually use um, PhilHealth strategic purchasing power to actually um, allow the private sector to expand testing. So um, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, sorry. So the next um, strategy is the capacity to isolate. So initially, the WHO, uh, the previous slide, please. So initially, the WHO um, suggested uh, this strategy, like test and isolate, but I think the strategy should be the other way around. We need to isolate and test, right? Um, as if you've seen the model, we, we don't need to wait for the test to isolate because we are running out of time if we if we do that. So um, I, I think we need to change the narrative from test and isolate to actually isolate and test. So if you have the symptom, we, we need to isolate them immediately. And uh, I think we haven't changed that narrative because I think we're too much focused on testing, but it's, I think it's important, but it's important to, to, to send the message that isolation is actually the primary strategy. Um, initially, there is um, the, the, the Department of Health was also suggesting home quarantine, but I think we need to shift that policy to, 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 to facility base, right? Um, I think if you look at the experience of other countries, um, especially Wuhan, they, they, they really invested in, in, in facility quarantine more than home quarantine. I think in the case of the Philippines, I think we should also think about if home quarantine is actually the way to go. Um, again, uh, one opening here is that we could actually use the private sector to help us build isolation facilities. As you've seen, field health and isolation package and I don't know why a, a lot, why private sector are not investing in isolation facilities because PhilHealth will actually pay for them. So I think it's also important to, to, to use that opportunity, um, um, at least by the private sector, to, to expand um, this important strategy, uh, in using the private sector to expand this strategy. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, I think, can you go back to the previous slide? I think, uh, previous, uh, one, one more, one more, like the capacity to, capacity to, capacity to, uh, trace. Yeah. So, um, the next, the next, um, um, health system capacity is actually to trace. 
And I actually, this is very important. So I, I call this like mass tracing instead of mass testing. I think it's important that we invest a lot of, of contact tracing. So I think the, the DOH already started thinking about this and they said that we need around one contact tracer for, for about for every 800 households. And, um, um, and if we do this, for example, in Quezon City, Quezon City will, uh, will need around 2,000 3, to 300 or 3,000 contact tracer. But um, LGU should think about this as a very important investment as we move from ECQ to, um, to, to risk-based strategy. In, in many countries, like even in, 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 in countries like the US or state like Massachusetts or New York, they started to, to, to hire a lot of contact tracers. So I think we should start investing on this. And, 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 and the good thing about this is that as, as we have additional two more weeks, um, the government or local government should start building its army of contact tracer. And as we, as we, as, as, uh, and after May, after May 31, we have enough contact tracers to actually do, um, do the surveillance um, um, as we move to, to, to GCQ. Next. So, so an another important capacity is we, we go to the hospital setting is the capacity to treat. So the government should establish COVID referral hospitals all over the country to promote efficiency. So um, I think this is actually a very, um, to me, it's, 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 uh, it's a silver lining because I think we are um, realizing the important um, features of the UHC, which is actually a referral system. So, um, and I think this is an opportunity to do it is to build referral system to make that to make the 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 system more efficient. So we are not putting all COVID patients with mild symptoms in hospital. We should put in, put them in a in in an in a, in a isolation facility, and those who are severe will be put in hospital. So so we can actually. Um, um, rationalize our 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 capacity to treat um obviously as what jana suggested we need to invest a lot of isolation ventilators and critical equipment and to me and or i mean to us it's it, it's fine to invest in these because if you look at our current supply there it's 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 very it's very low so we can still use them up even after the pandemic third is that there is the government should should start um, creating um, a standard treatment protocol for for treating um, for treating COVID um, um, for treating COVID um, to improve the quality of care. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, another one is the capacity um, of the system to monitor. Can, can you go back to the previous slide? Can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, yeah, so the capacity of the health system to monitor. So the government should establish robust IT system to actually monitor the trajectory of new cases real time. I think um, we've written this like a uh, long time ago, but I think we've we've now realized the importance of this, um, especially um, after the ECQ, we might see um, resurgence after two weeks and we need to catch that, um, that resurgence um, um, after lifting the ECQ. If we don't have a very robust idea, IT system, we might not be able to see that resurgence right away. So if you have a good IT system and and if you see uh, like you know you know rapid rapid rise in 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 in, in cases uh, real time, then we can actually uh, we would know what what um, interventions to do. What, what, like we need to recalibrate again our our strategy and you know real time reporting is very important. Next slide, please. Next slide. I think there's a lag. Um, so um, another criteria is there's ability um, of the system to protect the vulnerable population. Um, have you, uh, if you look at the number of cases, around 20% of our cases 
our health workers, I mean, I, I think our hypothesis is that because we are actually over testing um, because, you know, um, health workers are, 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 are our priority. I mean, if you look at the testing protocol, it's in the priority. So we're also getting many, many patients. Um, I mean, many health workers um, positive of COVID. COVID. So, so we need to protect them. So number one is that there should be enough supply and buffer of PPEs. Um, the the government should have a strategic plan to avoid depletion of PPEs. I mean, through you know exploring local production, importation, and looking at innovations. Um, um, the third is that the government has has to increase the number of health workers. And if you look at evidence uh, from uh, from many many countries, um, overwork and and stress is actually one of the risk factors of infection. So we need to think about um, not only PPEs but to 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 look at the optimal number of rotation and health um, and 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 work hours because there are important risk factor of infection, not only PPEs. Third. Um, another important um, risk factor is actually um, the, the, the lack or poor um, infection control in hospitals. So we also need to actually um, um, educate and strengthen the infection control programs or protocols of these of, of, of hospitals and health workers. Um, because if you look at the data, I think there is like huge variation across hospitals. So we, we need to um, also investigate what, what's causing that large variation in infection rate. Next slide, please. So uh, I think the DTI is also now doing this. Um, so as, as we transition, I think uh, we also need to implement um, um, religiously physical distancing, um, basic hygiene, like hand washing, temperature gathering um, um, should be in the workplace. Um, ability to implement not just to ensure employees abide with public health interventions. Um, um, workplaces has established outbreak strategic infection control plans. Um, and I, I think there are good um, um, protocols uh, on this. I think um, Taiwan and Korea, for example, listed down some of the important um, protocols on workplaces that we could just actually copy and you know readjust with our own setting. Uh, but if you look at those guidelines, it's actually um, like this, and um, so um, th this should be followed by work by by employees as we transition to ECQ. I, I think that's it. That's it. So I think that those are our recommendations. So thank you.